morning, everyone. We're so excited that you've joined us here at The Water's Edge. If you're online with us today, check us out on Facebook or YouTube and feel free to like, share, and comment. If you're live with us, there's a few things we'd like you to know. We have nursery and kid church available right across the lobby. Also, we're always in need of volunteers. So if you want to get plugged in, you can email us at watersedgevolunteer at gmail.com or text your contact info to 318-381-2676. And remember, if you know anyone that's struggling, please invite them to church or share our online content with them because this is a place where broken people belong and everyone is welcome. We have a full experience for you this morning, so let's get ready to worship and receive a message from Pastor Tony. What's up, everyone? Good morning and welcome to our Water's Edge online Sunday morning worship experience. Thank you so very much for tuning in, hanging out with us. For those of you that continue to like and share these online worship experiences with your circle of influence, continue to do that. Thank you so very much for doing that. We absolutely appreciate it. People are tuning in and getting help from all over the place. Also, for those of you that continue to worship with us online through giving and generosity, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave in John 3, 16, that he gave his only son. When you love, you give. And for those of you that give to our church, you allow us to help more people, love more people, feed more people, and serve more people. When we worship together through giving and generosity, God can do big things as we take our love to the streets. So thank you so very much for doing that. Today we finish up with our current series called Evening and Morning. And this series has been about this. Whenever I have serious doubts and questions about my faith and about God, how do I deal with them? Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever done something bad that you should not have done? I think we all have. But let's say that you did and you got caught. And the person or the people who could hand you the consequences, whether it was a teacher or a professor or a police officer or a parent or whoever, a boss or a manager, let's say the person or the company or the organization or the people that could hand you the consequences after you did something wrong decided to let you off the hook. You messed up and you deserved the consequences, but the people or the person who was able to hand out those consequences to you decided to not give you those consequences. What is that? I remember a few years ago, I had a wedding to do one Saturday night in Lafayette. And I had a, a funeral to do also that day. And so because of that, I was running late, leaving Lake Charles to go to Lafayette. I didn't get to leave Lake Charles till almost five o'clock. And, you know, with traffic on Saturday night, it was going to be impossible to make it to Lafayette in an hour. So, man, I was speeding down I-10, speeding down the interstate. And then it never fails. I saw the lights in the back rearview mirror and it was the cop lights I got pulled over doing 85 in a 65. And so the police officer, the state trooper, was talking to me. He goes, Mr. Bork, why are you in such a hurry? So I tried to explain to him the wedding situation, that I was on my way to Lafayette, late for a wedding, just got finished with a funeral, that I was a pastor. And then he said this. He goes, Mr. Bork, I clocked you doing around 85 in a 65. He said, but if you tell me that you were not wearing your seatbelt, that you didn't have it on, then I'm just going to give you a seatbelt violation. Well, that kind of confused me because I knew that he just busted me for speeding and I just couldn't fathom the fact that he was going to let me go for that and not give me a ticket. But then I started thinking, oh, he's trying to write me a ticket for not wearing my seatbelt, but I had my seatbelt on. So I didn't understand. I said, but officer, I have my seatbelt on. He goes, Mr. Bork, I'm going to say it again. He goes, if you tell me that you were not wearing your seatbelt, then I'm just going to give you a seatbelt violation and you can go. I said, but Mr. Officer, I'm sorry for speeding, but I was wearing my seatbelt. I promise he was Mr. Bork. You don't understand what I'm telling you. He's like, if you tell me that you were not wearing your seatbelt, then all I'm going to give you 
is a seatbelt violation and you can take off to this wedding. And finally it clicked that he was able to give me consequences for speeding, but on that day he was going to let me go and not hand me those consequences. If I told him that I wasn't wearing my seatbelt, he was going to give me a simple seatbelt violation and let me go. So I finally caught on. I said, oh yeah, I wasn't wearing my seatbelt and he let me go. Now let me explain to you what that is. That's mercy. Notice this today. Mercy is when you don't get what you absolutely do deserve. I messed up. I got caught. I deserve the speeding ticket. But the person who had the authority to hand me that speeding ticket and hand me that consequence decided to let me off the hook. That's mercy. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. And you got to understand that God also has a time of limitless mercy for you and I. Limitless mercy. And all you and I have to do is really just accept it. So many times in our life, God gives us mercy and we don't get what we do deserve. Now, on the other hand, sometimes we don't get what we do deserve. But have you ever been given something and it was something good? A gift. And you know that you didn't deserve that either. You didn't deserve this gift. You didn't work for it. You didn't pay for it. You didn't earn it. It wasn't owed to you. Someone was just good enough, cool enough, kind enough, and loving enough to give you something that you didn't work for and you didn't earn. Mercy is when someone doesn't give you what you do deserve. I messed up. I deserve the consequences, but mercy says I'm not going to give you the consequences. But grace is when you didn't work for something and you didn't earn something, but it was given to you anyway. I remember several years ago, as soon as I turned 26 years old, I was in seminary. I had just become a full-time pastor. I had just moved to Starks, Louisiana. I was pastor in a little church there. And my papa Scott, my mom's dad, was passing away from cancer. And he had this 89 model. It was a Chevy Tahoe Blazer with leather interior. So me and the family went all down to spend time with my papa, my mom's dad, before he passed. And we were hanging out that day. My dad was there. My mom was there. My brothers were there. And I remember before we left, my papa Scott said, Tony, come talk to me. Come sit down and talk to me. So I went and sat down and talked to him. And as I did, he handed me the keys to that Blazer. He goes, I don't need this anymore. And I'm going to give it to you. And on that day, he gave me an 89 model Chevy Tahoe Blazer. And I didn't work for it. I didn't pay for it. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He just gave it to me. And that's what grace looks like. And notice this today. Grace is when you're given or offered something that you absolutely do not deserve and you didn't earn it. I need, I have this need in my life. I have a struggle. I'm missing something. I didn't work for it. I didn't earn it. But the person who has the ability to give me something good, even though I didn't work for it, gave it to me anyway. And that's grace. In the same way, God has a ton of limitless grace for you and I just like like mercy and all you and I have to do is accept it and as children of God you and I are the church we're the visible expression of Jesus here on this earth and as the church you and I are the fountains and the givers and the examples of mercy and grace in this world mercy is when God does not give us what we do deserve and grace is when God gives us good gifts that we don't deserve and as visible expressions of Jesus Christ here in this world we're are also the fountains and the examples and the givers of mercy and grace. The question is, what is that? What does that look like? And also when we do this, it does something to you and I as disciples. When we are living examples of mercy and grace to this world, it does something to our faith. It does something to our endurance. It does something to our discipline. It does something to our walk with God. But what is is that Now, over the past few weeks, we've been in this series about overcoming doubts about our faith. And when it comes to our faith, I'd just like to share my heart with you today. And I may just do a little bit more preaching than teaching. But one thing I found to be true is this. This is always true for me and my heart and my faith and my walk with God. And notice this today. Anytime I put my faith into action and I make my faith visible to people who are watching, it always grows stronger. And our goal in making our faith visible is not to mark our Self as a Christian among all the other non Christians in this world. Our goal is not to identify ourselves as a Christian so everyone else around us knows that we're a Christian. For so many people, though, that's just the extent of their faith. For so many people, this is what their faith looks like they go to church on Sunday. 
And then after church, they get their family together and they all take a big selfie in front of the church and they post it on Instagram, Sunday fun day, we all went to church. Family at church, eating lunch after church, and it's just like a social media post. Or we get the Christian t-shirt, a t-shirt that says, I love Jesus, or Jesus is my homeboy, or all that kind of stuff. And we wear it to school, we wear it to college, we wear it to work, because we want everyone to know that we're a Christian. But for many people, that's just the extent of their faith. It's a social media post, or it's a t-shirt that they wear. But again, there's more to a relationship with Jesus than that. A relationship with Jesus is more than this public interest image that you try to create. A relationship with Jesus is not an Instagram pose. A relationship with Jesus is not buying the t-shirt and wearing the t-shirt so everyone else knows I love Jesus now. That's not what it really means to have a real living relationship with Jesus Christ. Faith is not about adopting a church life as you get a family, as you get older, so you can feel better about yourself because that's the right thing to do. It's not even about identifying yourself as a Christian among all the non-Christians in this world. Notice this today. Today, if you're still with me, Sam, still with you. Putting our faith into action has never been about identifying ourselves as Christians in a non-Christian world so we can show people what category we're in, so we can show people what team we're on, so we can show people what kind of church we go to, so we can show people what side we're on. That's not what it means to have faith in God. This is why we have faith in God, and this is why we put our faith into action. Notice this today. We make our faith visible so people who are struggling with their faith or people who are curious about the faith can see what an actively gracious and generous faith looks like. The last thing I want is for someone, anyone who is hurting and lonely and struggling and hungry and heartbroken and in need and confused and looking for God to look at my faith and look at how I live my faith out and look at how I put my faith into action or not put my faith into action and after they see me live and after they see me love and after they see my version of the faith for them to say no. No, I don't want to have anything to do with it. After they watch me live, it would break my heart after the lonely or the hungry or the struggling or the hurting, after they watch me live and after they see how I put my faith into action or how I don't put my faith into action for them to say no. If that's what faith in God looks like, I'm not curious anymore. If that's what faith in God looks like, I want to have nothing to do with it. Listen, we're not a Sunday show. We're a church. We're not just t-shirt wearers. We're a church. We're not just Instagram. Instagram poses on Sundays with our family. We're a church. We're not just good people. We're not just spiritual people. We're a church. We're not just people who come to church on Sunday for a show and buy the t-shirt. We are a church. And as the church, we want to live our faith out in such a way that it draws other people to Jesus and it doesn't push them away. And it also makes them curious. It makes them curious about God's grace. It makes them curious about God's mercy. It makes them curious about God's love. It makes them curious about having a relationship with Jesus. It makes them curious about serving God and following Jesus Christ with their heart and with their life. And that's how we should live our life in such a way that it makes the watching world curious and they want what we have. When our faith produces this type of curiosity in the world, this is when we know we're doing it the right way. We take our grace to the streets. We take our mercy to the streets. We take our hope to the streets. We take our love to the streets. This is who we are. This is street grace. Notice how the Apostle John puts it, following Jesus and actively showing compassion to other people always go hand in hand. Let me say that again. Following Jesus, a relationship with Jesus and actively showing compassion to other people, all people, it all goes hand in hand. And John was constantly teaching that Christ calls us to do this as believers, notice this today, if you're still with me, Sam's so still with you. God calls his children to actively look for ways to do for others who in that moment cannot do for themselves. God calls his children to actively look for ways to do for others who are hurting who in that moment cannot do for themselves. This is elementary and foundational to the faith, by the way. Notice how John puts it in the, gospel, in, in the book of 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and they see a brother or a sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? 
person. Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. Now, this isn't me saying this. This is the Apostle John. Notice the connection that John makes between your life, your faith, your love, your relationship with Jesus and following God. We know what real love is because Jesus laid down his life for us and we should lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. Notice how he connects our love to our giving. Notice how he connects our love in verse 16 and laying down our lives for each other and loving each other because we love God. Notice how he also connects that in verse 16 to how we use our material possessions in verse 17, this is not me saying this, this is John. If you say that you love God, if you say that you love people and you have resources to help people who in that moment cannot help themselves and you do help them, then you prove that you're living in the truth and your faith in Jesus is real. But if you say that you love God and if you say that you love people and you don't use what God has given you, your resources to help other people who in that moment cannot help themselves, then then your faith is shallow or it's not real at all. If you can help but you don't, then your faith is not real, the Apostle John says. As we move on to the next passage, think about this question and notice this today. What barriers do you have in your life that prevents you from being more generous? What can you start doing now to change that? One way is to make generosity a priority. You know, every single month I have bills that I have to pay. I have to pay my house note. I have to pay my electric bill. I have to pay our car notes, our insurance, and all that type of stuff. But something that's also a priority to me every single month is my giving to God's house, my giving to God's church so God's church can come together and be the visible expression of mercy and grace in the streets. It's automatic for me. It's a priority. The money that I give to this church is automatic every single month because I know that it goes to a bigger purpose to feed people and love people and shelter people and help people and give people people hope. It helps people connect with Jesus. They develop a relationship with Jesus. Then they get baptized. It helps people who are homeless find a group of people that love them. They find help. They find support. After that, many times they get into rehabs. After that, they get into their own apartments and they get jobs. And this is all based off of our generosity and our love. When we have the ability to help, we come together and we help. Notice what happens in John chapter 13 verses 12 through 15 as Jesus gets together with his disciples was an amazing scene here after washing their feet he put on his robe again and sat down and asked do you understand what I was doing you call me teacher and Lord and you're right because that's what I am and since I your Lord and teacher have washed your feet you ought to wash each other's feet I've given you an example to follow go and do as I've done for you in this passage Jesus who is king and Lord stoops down to literally wash the dust and the dirt off of his disciples' feet. Now think about this. When Jesus was serving his disciples, he was expressing to them their identity as a child of God. You have to understand what Jesus was doing as he knelt down and he was serving his disciples by washing their feet. As he was serving them, he was helping them understand their identity in Jesus Christ and their identity to God. I'm serving you because I want you to find Finally, see that you're loved by God. I want you to finally see that you're wanted by God. I want you to finally see that you're valued by God. I want you to finally see that you're precious to God. I want you to finally see that you're called by God. And so when someone serves us, that helps us see our identity in Jesus Christ. But Jesus also told them to go out and serve others by following his example. And so when you're serving me, that helps me see who I am to God. When you serve me, it helps me see that God loves me and God wants me and God has mercy for me and God has grace for me and God has hope for me and God has forgiveness for me and God has a new life for me. When you serve me, that helps me see my identity in Jesus Christ. But when I take my grace to the streets, when I take my mercy to the streets, that's when I find my purpose. When I serve others, it helps me. It brings fulfillment to my life. It brings excitement to my life. It brings joy to my life. It brings purpose to my soul. And so notice this today because this is so key. If you're still with me, Sam's still with you. 
When we're served, we find our identity in God. But when we serve others, we find our purpose in God. Understand that today. When someone serves us because they love Jesus, that helps us see our identity to God. God loves me. But also when we serve others, that helps you and I find our purpose in God. God has called us to serve. Now, very quickly, let's tie these two passages together. If you say that you love God and people and you have the resources to help people in need, do it. Because if you don't, the Apostle John says you may not have the real thing. So make generosity, if you're able, a priority of yours. And when we're served, we find our identity in God. But when we serve others, we find our purpose in God. So make serving a passion of yours. Now understand something. Every single Sunday, You and I gather together, we anticipate together, we pray together, we learn together, we worship together, but we should also come together as a ministry and take our grace to the streets by giving together, by giving together. The one thing that Jesus has always wanted us to say in our hearts is this, and notice this today, Jesus, I'm simply available. You have to understand something. This church, the Water's Edge Church, has been a blessing to so many people. I remember one Christmas, we gave over 600 bicycles to families who couldn't give their kids bicycles for that Christmas. We gave over 600 bicycles away. I remember one day, uh, one servanthood project we had at this neighborhood right behind the mall, we gave over 300 boxes of diapers away to single mothers for newborn babies. I remember not too long after that, we gave 150 box fans away one summer to the elderly because it was too hot for them to run their air conditioning unit. Units all day. On top of that, every single month we feed about 2,000 people through our food pantry, and every single week we feed about 75 homeless people from our community. We help, we serve, we give as a church. We help, we serve, we give as a church. We help, we serve, we give as a church. We've been blessing to so many people, but we also want you to be a part of this ministry going forward continuing to take our grace and mercy and love to the streets and to, not less th- and to not let this church just be a blessing to you. Let me say that again. We want you to be a part of this church taking our grace and love to the streets and don't just let this church be a blessing to you, but you also be a blessing to your church so we can bless our city. Don't just let this church be a blessing to you. Don't just be a consumer, but you also need to be a blessing to your church so your church can continue to have a future and bless our community and bless our city. Here I am, Jesus. I'm available. It's awesome to receive. It's awesome to receive love. It's awesome to receive help. It's awesome to receive grace and mercy. But we all love that, but it's even much more better to give. Paul even said that in Acts chapter 20 verse 35. Notice this today. It's great, great to receive, but it's even better to give. He said this, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more of a blessing to give than it is to receive. So let's all do this together. Let's all use our resources together to do something big, amazing, and fun next month in December. We will all miss out on so much joy, purpose, and excitement if we don't do this together. We miss out on so much joy, purpose, and excitement when we don't worship together, when we don't serve together, when we don't pray together, but we also miss out on so much when we don't give together. So starting this December, next month, On December the 17th, Sunday, December the 17th, we're going to have something called Future Sunday. And I want us to do it big on this Sunday. But this is what our Future Sunday is going to be about on December the 17th. It's going to be about faith. It's going to be about vision casting, inspiration, purpose, love, grace, mercy, and giving to make sure that our future is strong. On that Sunday, we're going to be taking up something called a vision offering, and that vision offering is going to be going to a very specific ministry in our church 
to help that ministry do more ministry, help more people, give grace and mercy to more people, give love to more people, give compassion to more people, give service to more people, give God to more people. And so this year, our vision offering on December the 17th is gonna go to the food pantry. This is what we're gonna call it. Notice this today, Merry Christmas food pantry. And on that day, this is what we're going to ask you to do. So we need all you online listeners to maybe show up in person December the 17th, 930 or 1115. And we're going to take up our uh, future Sunday vision offering. And this is what we're going to ask you to do. Bring box goods for the food pantry, box goods, canned vegetables, canned goods, or peanut butter, peanut butter. As much box goods, as much canned goods, as much peanut butter as we can take up on that day to stock our food pantry, bring it. We'll have an area in the lobby on December the 17th for you to bring your box goods, your canned goods, your jars of peanut butter. If you say, Tony, I don't have time for that, then bring $10. That'll help us buy food. And this is our goal. Each food pantry that we do, and our next food pantry is going to be in January probably, each food pantry that we do usually costs the church around $8,000. We want to try to have enough food and enough resources and enough funds to fund three food pantries the next three food pantries without even touching what other people have given to the church and that kind of stuff. We want to take up so much food that day that we can do three food pantries and not even touch our budget dipping into that. And we want to serve our community in love and grace. If we can all do this together on future Sunday to the 7th and 17th, if we can all do this together, it'll be an act of faith. It'll be an amazing thing. It'll be a miracle for us, really. But more than that, it'll be fun, exciting, and full of purpose. And we can all do this together. So future Sunday, December the 17th, let us see your face. Bring some box goods, cans goods, peanut butter, or just bring an offering. And it'll, go, it'll all go to our next three food pantries. And it'll bless our community because that will allow us to feed almost 7,000 people people from our community 7,000 people thank you so much for hanging out with us today let's take our mercy and grace to the streets now continue to stay plugged in stay tuned in for an amazing time of worship with the amazing Waters Edge worship team we love you all we cannot wait to see you back next week
What a great message from Pastor Tony. We really hope that today's worship experience has encouraged and helped you in some way today. If you were moved by today's service and want to stay tuned in the rest of the week on social media, check us out at Water's Edge Gathering on Facebook or Water's Edge underscore LC on Instagram. You can also download our app where you can do online giving, listen to worship songs, and replay messages from Pastor Tony. If you want to learn more about salvation and baptism, want to volunteer, or need a prayer request, visit our Welcome Center in the lobby and one of our volunteers will take down your information. We absolutely love you guys and can't wait to see you back next week at the Water's Edge where everyone has a place to belong.